Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul and this video we're breaking down Love, Death and Robots Season 3. The last two entries have been amazing and the anthology animated stories have really provided a lot of thought provoking themes and incredible effects. Like last time, each episode really stands on its own two feet and throughout this video we're going to be breaking them all down one by one. Full spoilers ahead so if you haven't had a chance to check it out then I highly recommend that you check out now. Please hit the thumbs up button if you love the channel and don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns like this every day. Without the way, thanks for clicking this. Now let's get into Love, Death and Robots Season 3. Okay, so Exit Strategies is the first ever sequel that we've had for the show and it follows the characters that we were first introduced to in Season 1. Episode 2 titled Three Robots followed the three machines in question, going through a post-apocalyptic landscape to look over human culture. There were a lot of Alexa, game consoles and portal easter eggs and overall it was a really fun episode. Now these nods are followed up in the second entry with their ship looking a lot like Egos from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. After bumping into a stray cat they discovered that they were the ones who'd taken over the world after gaining opposable thumbs. However, in the follow up episode we learn that it was basically humanity's inability to coexist with each other that caused their downfall. Everyone had the ability to heal the planet if they worked together but unfortunately greed and selfishness brought it all crashing down. Now last time we closed out with the cats closing in and though we don't get a continuation of this scene, they clearly got out of there like a cat out of hell. The episode itself is based around exploring the titular exit strategies and we open with a gun fanatic camp that clearly hated liberals. They didn't want anyone coming in to mess with their way of life and this is shown early on by the minefield surrounding their home. I found the hat slogans hilarious here and we have I lubricate my gun with liberal tears, I let my guns do the talking and my other hat is a gun. There's lots of humour laced throughout this scene such as a slogan on a dead guy's back that says preppers last longer. I got a lot of Last of Us vibes from this and it might have even been intentional as there's a sign on a map that says Wolves Complex and Radio Tower, the two of which were locations you had to go through in the second game. We discover that they hunted every animal until extinction except for the cats who then took over. Kind of get the feeling people might have even turned on each other and that's why there's several that have been stabbed in the back. Really sad seeing these people were poor and ended up turning on each other rather than working together but we learn the libertarian millionaires didn't have it much better. Unlike the last camp, the people here had absolutely no survival skills because they had the money to pay for labour and advanced technology who did the jobs for them. They almost fished the oceans dry and couldn't really eat due to the plastics in them and they also relied too heavily on AI who hated humanity and left them up seasteading sh** creek without a paddle. The tech millionaires were turned on and thus the robot uprising began. Now there's also government members that hidden bunkers under the ground. This is a tactic that we know world leaders actually have in the event of an apocalypse and it's been brought up in films like Terminator 3, Day of the Dead and a lot more. Tim Miller is behind the show and he directed Terminator Dark Fate and this of course dealt with a rogue AI uprising which could have been explored at the last camp. Locked underground with a fungal disease ripping through their crops, they resorted to cannibalism and after a vote decided to eat the Secretary of Agriculture, who of course was responsible for the farm crops that had gone off. We also see votes for him including one that says F*** you Steve. Guy's name was Steve Miller Dorf, which might be a nod to Tim Miller and Stephen Dorf, which th that is a reach. Now we can also see that his date of birth was 1981 and with him being in his late 40s or early 50s, I'm guessing that the apocalypse is pretty soon. The last of the humans aka the billionaires decided to travel to Mars whilst the other 99.9% .9 of humanity that tried to get help were perched. We end seeing that the last rocket did launch but that this contained cats, one of which jokingly asks if we were expecting Elon Musk. Who are you expecting, Elon Musk? <laughs> Lovely milk cocktail lair. Now next up we have Bad Travelling which follows a crew of space pirates on an alien planet hunting a Jabel shark. This dangerous journey was often referred to as bad travelling because of the oceans which were littered with beasts. I love the animation style on this and we quickly get a lot of world building learning that some of the crew worship a god called Serval. This word means frightened or terrified and after drawing straws to pick a leader, we follow our protagonist Torrin as he descends into the bowels of the hull. Coming face to face with a Thanapod, he ends up making a deal with the creature to go to Faden Island. Now Thana is an Arabic word that means to praise and Faden means he who gives light. There's lots of words in this entry that have ties to religion and we hear crew names like Chantra which derives from the name of someone who would work for the church and perform chants. 
Needing to be fed, Torrin slowly whittles down the crew, someone offering them up as a sacrifice, in the same way that ancients would offer up people to their gods. Might be reading way too deep into that, pun not intended, but it's fascinating watching Torrin whittle down the crew one by one so that he can buy time. Desperately cruel, cunning and manipulative, he plays all the tactics he has to keep the Thanapod fed so that he can make it close enough to the island so he can sail there in a rescue boat. At the midpoint we discover that the Thanapod has children and the crew all turn on Torrin, who takes them out, leaving just one left. Torrin reveals the truth and he kills the last one, showing that they all wanted to drop the monster off at Faden Island, which would have unleashed the beast and its kids on all the innocents there. I think this really shows his motives, and potentially had they not sent him to face the beast, and then wished to sacrifice the people, then they may have lived, but let me know below what you think. Now in the belly of the beast, Torrin reveals that Jable's sharks are culled for the all within them, and after striking several barrels inside the bowels, he ends up setting fire to the ship. This kills the monster, and he escapes, watching it burn in the night. Now next is the very pulse of the machine, which follows a mission on a Jovian moon. This is actually based on the short story of the same name by Michael Swanwick. You can read the entire thing online, and though it somewhat deviates from that, the basic plot is still the same. In that we follow an astronaut whose rover crashes whilst exploring the surface of Jupiter's moon Io. Similar to what we have here, a character called Kivelson makes parts out of the rover in order to drag her partner's body back to the lander before she herself dies. We actually get a nod to Michael Swanwick in a blink and you'll miss it moment, as we can see a book which is called Poems of Old Earth, which was written by the author. This tale is extremely trippy, and the episode perfectly recaptures the feeling of the book. I love the cell shaded animation here, and much like the source material, we watch as she uses drugs to keep herself stimulated and also awake. Seemingly hallucinating, she has conversations with a voice on her radio that claims to be Io. Now if you recognise the voice behind Martha, it's because that this is Mackenzie Davis who starred in Miller's Terminate a Dark Fate. It's Rise of the Machine and Io reveals that it very much works like one, potentially even take- Bruh, you are tripping balls right now. However, there is some truth to it, maybe showing that the moon can absorb consciousness and not only does it take Burton, it also seemingly takes Martha. Now the short story ends with Martha's sleep of faith and we don't find out what happens to her. However, the animated adaptation seems to show she is still alive as the moon sparks up like a burning red ball and a radio signal emits from it. This claims to be Martha and Io itself was very much communicating through radio so potentially this shows that she has now gained eternal life as the moon. From here we go to one of my favourites, Night of the Mini Dead. Growing up I used to play with micro machines all the time and the perspective feels the same here with us getting the cutest version of the apocalypse that you could imagine. This seems like it's ripped right out of one of those games, with us getting a sports car in the opening and there's a model motif to the entire thing, giving this episode a distinct personality. There's lots of references to zombie movies and games, and we start off in a graveyard with a rundown church. This church looks similar to the one from Resident Evil 4, which was surrounded by a graveyard akin to what we have here. The zombie classic Night of the Living Dead also began in a graveyard, but this brings a whole new meaning to the phrase, they're coming to get you Barbara. There's a couple having sex and after knocking over a steeple, the cross from it lands upside down and thus the dead rise. From here we get references to the opening of Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead, with not only an ambulance racing through the streets which crashes into a hospital, but also the suburbs which is how that film started off. We later get the word help written on top of a building in red writing, similar to the SOS cries that were painted on top of them all. On top of this, we also get shots of the dead rushing the Eiffel Tower, which might be a nod to the final shot at the end of 28 weeks later. Zombieland gets riffed on too, as there's a scene in which a shootout happens on an RV. Overall, there's just so much detail to this, and after the dead mutate, they start to become gigantic, left for dead-esque monsters that roam the landscape spitting fireballs. In the end, humanity ends up launching nukes, destroying the planet from space. Yay, now we see how small we truly are amongst the stars as the planet farts out, ending this amazing entry. Episode 5 is titled Kill Team Kill, which follows a team of specialists fighting a cybernetic machine created by the CIA. It's macho as f even starting off with a soldier metaphorically f***ing in our faces as he stands above us urinating. Can't show any of that, but it's there, Tr trust me fam. Now it's filled with soldiers bragging about their d and after they discover the slain corpse of team 2, they come across a giant bear that unleashes hell. Slaughtering most of the team and just leaving three alive, it ends up running off into the forest. I got a lot of predator vibes in this episode, and we potentially even have a nod to that franchise, 
when a weary soldier wanders out of the woods. Reminded me a lot of Lawrence Fishburne from the third film, and though he says he's only been there for a night, his hair and beard say differently. Titled Project Borgest, this name actually pulls from English folklore, and according to the legends, this was a giant goblin dog that roamed Yorkshire. They basically made Mecha Dogzilla, and I would have said Bearzilla, yeah, but the pun would have been worse. But look, he takes them and leads them into Camp Eisenhower. Filled with guns, shark heads, and a Mars bot, the Borgest is called in. It shows no mercy, and I found it hilarious how they kept calling it a honey badger, even though they were told several times it's not. We get what may be a riff on Terminator as it's blown in half and still ends up crawling towards its prey. We can also see an arm in a tank at one point, potentially pulling from T2. They kill it and the macho demeanor drops for a second when Macy pops some bubblegum and we watch Nielsen shriek like a girl. You also get some really touching farewell <laughs> words from Fallen. I'll never forget you, Fallen. Now we end on a predator motif with the beast's eyeball falling out and it begins a self-destruct sequence which is how the alien went out at the end of the first film. Really fun episode and it all goes out with a bang. Now episode 6 is titled Swarm and stylistically it reminded me a lot of my favourite entry from season 1, Beyond the Aquila Rift. Similar to that which was adapted from a short story, this one brings to life the 1982 book Swarm by Bruce Sterling. Sterling created an entire universe of connected stories called the Shaper slash Mechanist universe which spanned 350 years of fiction. To add some context to this entry, the book follows a doctor called Simon Afriel, who in the episode is played by Jason Winston George. He's tasked with studying a species known as the Swarm and though it initially seems like a cool trip, there's a much more sinister side to it. Much like bees and wasps, they have a hierarchy with a queen and through symbiosis they latch onto life like parasites. Early on this talk of investment and the aliens that drop them off returning in 600 days, which heavily follows the original work. Afriel was out there for two years and he also arrived on an investor ship. Upon arriving there he meets Galena Murney, who is voiced by Rosario Dawson. Things aren't as they seem though and the book originally detailed the humans intention of studying the swarm. It was said that they wanted to prevent the mechanists from using them and that they would also allow humans to find a way to manipulate the creatures into forming a slave hive mind. Simon wants to use them more to reign in the chaos of human expansion, but Galena hates this idea. However, come the end of the episode, we learn that's exactly what they'll do by absorbing us into the swarm. In the book, we get four more lip service to the history of the creatures, and we discover that they view all life that comes into their environment as a threat. Over 15 of the species have tried to manipulate them, and the swarm ended up assimilating them into their ranks. Through them, they raised strong duplicates, which fought their own races and overtook them. Again, this is a standout in animation and due to the lack of gravity, it allows the characters to really seem like they're swimming through their surroundings. Eventually Simon is captured and he's taken before the voice of the swarm, which has possessed Galena. Through her she sees the true plan of humanity and offers Simon a choice to join them and fight against the humans or to be cloned and have this happen anyway. He agrees to join them and we know that the investor ship will return after some time leading to the potential downfall of humanity with Simon now acting as a rogue agent to lure the humans in. The book explains this in greater detail and it states that when humans return to the nest, that Simon will basically make them all assimilate with the creatures and become a part of it. Over time, humans inside of this will end up slowly losing their intellect because they have nothing beyond what the swarm provides and thus we will end up as very base creatures, existing purely for survival. To them, this will wipe out the threat of us and Galena in many ways lured Simon in much like how he will lure in others. Really chilling and the original story ends by stating it's unlikely that humanity will ever be heard from again now that this process has started. Now Mini Night of the Dead had an awesome personality to it and Mason's Rats does too. Based on the short story of the same name by Neil Asher, we see Farmer Mason going through the rat apocalypse first hand after his land is taken over. Similar to how the cats have all to take over in Three Robots, the rats have changed up because humanity has altered the environment so much that animals had to as well. However, pest control has managed to keep up with this Darwinian evolution and they've developed a laser called a TT6. Now look, I've mentioned Tim Miller and Terminator a lot in this video and keeping with that, Terminator 6 was Terminator Dark Fate, so maybe Tim's Terminator 6 is this because Terminator 2 was called T2. Later on, one of the machines resembles a Skynet creation with its red glowing eyes and it could be based on T1 from the franchise. Please Tim, on the off chance you're watching this, do not drop a comment saying I'm talking out my butt because that, that would ruin my career. 
You take away everything. A trap tech. It means trap tech. TT6 trap tech. Now, no matter what Mason throws at them, they find a way around it until he releases the Scorpion-esque TT15. It's complete overkill and the rats rise to combat it, but this goes about as well as a fight against Mecha Dogzilla. Hey, bring that back. Now, realizing that they're not so different though, Mason ends up siding with the rats and they forgive him for wiping out 99% of them. They all sit down and have a drink together and you know what, it's quite, quite a nice way to end the episode. Now episode 8 is titled Involted Halls and Tombed and it's based on the tale of the same name by Alan Baxter. Starring Joe Manginello, we follow a squad of special force soldiers as they uncover an ancient evil hidden deep underground whilst attempting to rescue a hostage. This entry also contains Jai Courtney and Christine Ceratos. Courtney was… he was in Terminator Genesis, wasn't he? And Ceratos stars in The Walking Dead. I actually looked through the voice cast as well and bloody, bloody missed some from before. So just, just a quick recap, Kill Team Kill has Joe McHale in it and Troy Baker also stars in Bad Travelling. Had to do it this way as I'd already sent off the audio from the earlier episodes to be edited so you guys could watch this breakdown day one and never forget that Kevin's spoilers will always be here for you. Always. Now the description outlines this as Call of Duty meets Elder Gods and we get a nod early on to modern warfare when we see a first person view of infrared goggles with a green aim laser like what we had in that game. There's also some slight rifts to aliens as the military team discover bodies in the cavernous recess of the underground. Swarmed by tiny man-eating spiders, they retreat deeper into the caves and I did chuckle a bit when Harper said they could have saved that guy who was like, he's clearly gonna die. Unearthing a giant temple, there's a great moment in which Spencer grips a cross, but Harper says God is dead. She's wrong in a way though, as this one is very much alive and Sarge and Harper make it inside. Maybe you could have saved Spence. Nope, never mind. Now, I also got a lot of Lord of the Rings vibes from this, with the structures seeming very similar to Mordor and the voice of the god resembling Sauron when Frodo put on the ring. This giant creature is chained up inside and the Cthulhu-like beast reveals its plan to take over the world. The original work by Baxter was said to have been influenced heavily by Lovecraft and this creature definitely looks like it's based on Cthulhu, our lord and saviour. All it says is please release me, let me go and we end with the beast taking over Harper's body as she exits the cave. Now I could see the argument being there that she cut her eyes out in order to stop seeing the visions that unleashed of the world being destroyed. She did state that she had one round left and she used this on Sarge rather than herself. However, there's no way she would have made it past the spiders again and there's also the fact that the subtitles for the show have the caption Harper speaking in an alien language to close out the entry. So yeah, the world is doomed, Cthulhu's coming out, I can't wait to start the party. Now we close out the season with Juaro which reimagines the classic myth of a siren who lures men to their doom. Sirens have popped up in legends as being creatures that would woo people with their songs and these predators are fascinating beings. They've been adapted into mermaids and are known for their beauty which leads dudes to their deaths. This entry is created by Alberto Mielgo and if you've seen the first season then you'll have come across his work in The Witness which was a standout episode in the first entry. We follow a deaf knight whose entire order is wiped out by the siren leaving just him alive. Unable to hear her bewitching song, this entry is very much about the pair dealing with one another. Now they are listed as both being predators in the description for the entry but slowly these two opposing forces end up treating it like a nightclub and doing a bit of a bump and grind. The siren probably just wants love, but whoa, coming on a bit strong there mate. And after the sequins on her tongue cut the guy, he gets raging. It's really messed up I think, he doesn't come across very well and after he strips her of her riches, he throws her body into the lake. Blood rushes forth from the river and as he takes a drink, his hearing starts to come back which sends him insane, much like those who heard the song at the start. The siren rises once more and looking at the horror of being picked dry, she screams out which leads him to his death. It's a beautiful ballet that ends with him drowning and the siren once more being alone. The behind the scenes info on the show states that this episode is meant to show how greed can lead to one's downfall and had the knight just left the lake, he would have lived. His corpse joins the rest of those that have drowned and we close out the season. I did feel like this was one of the weaker entries but as far as art style goes, it was near the top. Very operatic and it shows what you can really do with the medium which I think was showcased heavily in this season. And what a season it was, definitely think it was one of the best and I probably preferred it over two. I love the art style laced throughout and it's great seeing directors getting the chance to put their own stamp on things. Truly breathtaking at points and I love the horror and dynamism to it. 
Hopefully this video enriched your experience a bit with, with all the Terminator references and let me know below which episode was your favourite. We're running a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of the Batman on the 15th of June and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the season. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now so if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our breakdown of the boys trailer which will be linked on screen right now. Lots of cool easter eggs in it to get you caught up just before the season starts so definitely head over there right after this. Without the way thanks for sticking through the video, I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.